If you are in higher education, then you don't need me to tell you that colleges are concerned about enrollment. But in the last couple of weeks, as students have actually begun to complete the final steps for returning to campus, an interesting issue has reared its head, liability waivers that colleges are requiring students to sign. Podcast listeners and colleagues alike have asked me to comment on this. An example is Maria Gray, a rising junior at Bates College, who said she was on the fence about returning to college when Inside Higher Ed reported that she was confronted with this screen when she tried to log in to her account. Just think about how unusual this is. You've got a student entering junior year who, during the course of an ordinary login to the college system, and she was actually alone at that moment without a professional to explain the significance, is confronted with a short disclaimer and a button to push. And that button, once pushed, appears to absolve the college of all COVID-related liability, even in the event of death. Oh, and did I mention that there's no other way to get into the system except by pushing that button? Maria isn't alone. Schools everywhere are asking students to make these kinds of legal commitments. And some students are more vulnerable than others, or at least create more liability than others, because of specific lifestyles. It appears, for example, that student athletes are more likely to be asked to sign such waivers than other students. Ohio State, the University of Missouri, and Southern Methodist University are among the schools that are currently requiring students to sign such waivers before they can show up to play and claim their athletic scholarships. Colleges face a significant dilemma. On the one hand, colleges can be likened to what Heidi Feldman of the Los Angeles Times calls a cruise ship, a cinema multiplex, and a restaurant all rolled into one. On the other hand, Colleges are in unfamiliar waters, and the extent to which colleges could be held liable if their students or employees catch coronavirus while involved in college classes or activities has become a central question as they contemplate different approaches to reopening. Colleges and their lobbying groups believe that they are vulnerable to lawsuits, both in large numbers and with the potential for significant liability, if they reopen and transmission explodes. If that explosion occurs, students will experience various degrees of illness and some will undoubtedly die. It's not enough for colleges to argue that they took precautions, partly because there's obviously plenty of room for argument around whether the precautions colleges are taking are sufficient, to say nothing of the central question of whether colleges should have reopened in the first place. Ultimately, higher education wants blanket legal protections, but so far it hasn't gotten it. There is strong opposition to the idea of legal protection for colleges. This opposition isn't limited to just colleges. It's an opposition to the idea that employers should have these legal protections, whether in manufacturing or service industries or in education. The opposition primarily comes from congressional Democrats and labor unions who are concerned that the organizations these laws would protect would do too little to protect vulnerable students and workers, and that the result of such protections may in fact appear to be, in retrospect, reckless behavior. Particularly influential are the players' associations for the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, Major League Baseball, and Major League Soccer, who have all stated in a letter to top Republican and Democratic lawmakers that they oppose inserting blanket liability protections for employers in legislation. In contrast, a Republican proposal would offer considerable protections. It would provide five years of legal protection for businesses, hospitals, schools, and nonprofits that make reasonable efforts to comply with government standards to protect their workers and customers. Presumably, that would include students. Plaintiffs would need to prove that their illness resulted from gross negligence or willful misconduct. That's a very high standard, since many cases would presumably arise merely from ignorance or lack of resources. Perhaps the biggest bar or the biggest obstacle to litigation under the Republicans' proposal? A provision subjecting those who are found to have brought claims without merit to punitive damages and civil penalties of up to $50,000. 
Currently, both top Republicans and the White House view liability protection as a red line that must be part of any agreement. Polls of the public on this issue have turned out to be useless, simply mirroring the views of whoever paid for the poll. When the American Association for Justice, a group representing plaintiffs' lawyers, polled the public, it showed that nearly two-thirds of the public opposed employer liability protections. But when the U.S. Chamber of Commerce funded a poll, it found that 61% support protections. So what to do? Trick question, because the answer is that if you're interested in what you're hearing in this video, let me know. This is your chance to hit the like and subscribe buttons below, and you can hit the notification bell button if you want to be informed about the newest releases on this channel. But once you've done that, consider this. If you are an administrator at a school that is contemplating such liability waivers, I strongly urge you to avoid them. First, they don't look good. <laughs> but secondly, and more importantly, I seriously question their effectiveness. College students are smart people and are legally adults, but I have not found a single legal expert who believes that merely entering a student ID number during what can be often a first-time, rushed, unfamiliar enrollment process constitutes a legally binding act on the part of the student. Colleges are offering such liability waivers because they can't think of anything else to do, not because there's any specific reason to believe that they actually offer substantial liability protection for the college. They hope to discourage claims or require a specific setting for resolving claims like mediation or create a legal hurdle to a lawsuit since the student would first have to show that the waiver was not binding, all of which would make a lawsuit more difficult, expensive, and cumbersome to the plaintiff. If you are a student who encounters such a form, you should not complete it unless the school refuses to budge and you have no other educational options. I think that scenario is unlikely. Schools will budge because they know that most people have other options, and unless the school has a very deep waiting list, they are not going to let a liability waiver cost them a student. Above all, schools should remember while it is the nature of a college to convene large groups of employees and students under the umbrella of a college's operations, with that comes a responsibility toward those who work and study there. Sweeping liability releases are really just an abdication of that responsibility. If the danger to students, and therefore also to the college, is so great that students need to be coerced into signing away their rights to hold the school accountable for its decisions, Perhaps that might be the first clue that the school may have its priorities wrong. I hope this information has been helpful to you, and I hope that as you begin the fall semester, you are safe and healthy. I urge you to have a listen to this week's podcast, in which the Harvard student body president outlines the difficult decisions that Harvard University has had to make in the way it is approaching the fall semester. I'll put a link to that podcast in the notes below. I look forward to talking with you again next week.